We're going to close out Ezra today. As I'm reading this and I'm preparing and I'm studying for this is there is a very heavy sense about the closing of the Old Testament. And we don't often as Christians spend much time on the last years or so, the last couple decades of God's Word in the Old Testament. It's really Old Testament. We put an emphasis on the old part. It's, it's law. It's the Israelites. It's not really Christians. It's not the church. It's the old stuff. It's them. Yes, exactly. And so there, and then there's this large gap between Nehemiah and the story of the walls being built and the end of that and Malachi's final prophecy. And then there's quiet, 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 400 some odd years. John the Baptist shows up and everybody in the church gets happy. Yeah, we get, oh good, we're, we got our part in it. And as if that story has, has really no relevance to the God that has this story, our story. And one of the things that we've been doing in this study, in the survey, is watching how much of what God did in the old is moving us towards the birth of Christ, the advent of Christ, the coming of Christ, the solution, the rescuer, the deliverer from all that could not happen and could not be delivered and could not be rescued in the Old Testament through the Old Testament ways. And so we have this, this New Testament of gospel grace and this Old Testament of an old grandfather, mean, angry, walks around with a big stick, smashing people, uh, type Old Testament God and we, we ha we, when we started this it was very difficult to find how, how is that God like this God and, and what was his story here and this story there and as we get to the end of the Old Testament I'm seeing more need for the New Testament I'm seeing a greater need for a rescuer it is as if God took people, humanity, throughout all those thousands of years in the Old Testament story to get them to a place where they realize there is nothing left in you. There is no hope in you. I've given you the law. That didn't work. I've given you a sacrificial system. That didn't work. I've given you a covenant. That didn't work. I've given you all the things. I've revealed myself to you. That didn't work. I've taken you as a people. I've made you a people. We get to the end of the Old Testament. And as we look into the story of Ezra, the last parts of Ezra, Ezra is going to give you the need for Christ as we look at it. He's going to identify why Jesus came. And I didn't, I was like I said, when I was going through this, you get to the Old Testament and the end of the Old Testament particularly and you go, wow, man is truly, completely hopeless. He has no resource to call on to get to heaven, to be right with God. He is completely and totally depraved. Doesn't change much. It hasn't changed much, but I think by pushing the Old Testament away, making it their thing, not a Christian church thing, that we lose a very significant part of our gospel message. We lose the depth of what Christ has done. How much we really, really need Christ. And God's grace. So I want to start with an argument from Paul in the New Testament to set up Ezra's comment in chapter 9 and chapter 10 of Ezra. So let's go to Romans chapter 3. Now if you were with us in our Romans study, this will be very familiar territory. In chapter 1 of Romans, 
Paul has already talked about the fall of all humanity, all the pagan world, the Gentile world, those who had not been given any revelation of God other than creation. And yet Paul says they're guilty. Because even though they knew God, they knew the truth about God, they didn't give thanks to Him and they didn't glorify Him. And they made idols instead. And so God gave them up. Chapter 2, you have more of the Jew, the moralist, the good guy. If I just do enough good stuff, then I will earn and I'll deserve to go to heaven. And Paul slices and dices that apart and says, that's not true either. And he comes to chapter 3 in verse 9. And we're going to start in verse 9. And I just want to read a little part of this. And, I want to, we're, and we'll see what Paul's conclusion is. What is the conclusion of all of history? What is the bottom line truth? Verse 9. For what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the verdict. That's, or that's the indictment. That's the charge. That's the conclusion Paul comes to. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, that describes you, that describes me, that describes everybody who has ever been born, save Christ. No one righteous, no one understands, and no one seeks God. That's your plight. That's your state. And so in verse 19, Paul continues... Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight, that's God's sight, by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscience, conscious of sin. We stand, this, is, this is lawyer talk. This is courtroom talk. He says, we get to the end of the verdict, we get to the end of the proof, and we stand before a righteous, holy God, and we have nothing to present a defense. We are so defenseless, so hopeless, we can't even utter a word. We are silenced. The proof makes us silenced. There is nothing we can say in our behalf to appease or appeal to God. You get that? Is there any doubt about that? Now, how many times have you heard that recently? Pick the last year of going to church, listening to the church radio. That's not something we typically hear anymore. It's not that, we're not really that bad. Jesus is a friend of sinners he doesn't hate sin, really. He'll overlook what you did because he died for you. So, he's okay. He's okay with you. He's okay with what you're at. Now, if anybody wants to know, that's sarcasm. No, <laughs> okay, well, some people don't know because I, I pull off sarcasm pretty, <laughs> pretty seriously. But that's how, we, that's how many people approach the gospel. We have a a friendly gospel, an easy gospel. It's so easy to become saved. Because all it is really is we just want to accept Jesus. We want to say, yeah, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I'm not quite as bad as some of those people out there, but you know, Hitler, he, you know, you know he's going to hell. <coughs> you know. Pol Pot, he's going to hell. Saddam Hussein. Oh, you know, probably he's going to hell too, you know, more than likely. I am so glad I'm not quite that bad. Jesus only had to die for me a little bit. 
Wrong. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> but that's how we get to it. Our unrighteousness before a righteous God convicts us beyond defense. We are left with nothing. There, at our very core, everything about us opposes God. That's our indictment. That's the charge to humanity. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight. There's nothing within us that we can pull out of our pocket and say, Oh, but look what I did. Oh, but look at this. And that's the conclusion. The conclusion is there's nothing. You have no righteousness within you. He says no one is righteous. What if you were baptized? No. No. Nothing. Nothing. Verse 23 is the one that everybody remembers in chapter 3 of Romans. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the verdict. All right. With that in mind, let's go back to Ezra chapter 9. Because I often wonder, I see a lot of the, in the, New, I see a lot of the Old Testament in the New Testament. We have this foreshadowing thing going on in the Old Testament that points to the New Testament. But I often wonder, does it ever go back the other way? Does, ever, does anything in the Old Testament reflect what was true in the Old Testament? And that is just as true also. All those things that Paul just used to indict and point at us and say, no one is righteous, no one seeks God, no one understands, their tongue is, or their mouth is an open uh, pit, grave, all that, that's quoted from the Old Testament. It existed in the Psalms. It's where most of it's coming from. Yes? Um, I keep thinking about what you said earlier that the God of the Old Testament was so harsh and so uh, eager to destroy his enemies and, and those that uh, didn't obey him. And in the New Testament, oh, he's much nicer. We have Jesus and it's softer and less dangerous and I, I mean, I hear that, but as a parent who loves my child, my children, mm -hmm. fiercely, I cannot imagine a more angry and ready to punish God, God than one who spits on his son who died for him. In other words, those who, in our age, hear the word and go, eh, that Jesus, and then they use foul language about him, and they tell, tell the world that they don't believe in God's Son. Mm -hmm. I think the Old Testament is a piece of cake compared to what he's going to lay on them. That is right. fearful to me. Because I know how I would feel if one of my children died. And, and nobody gave son. respect to your and son. They spit on him. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. And I and I agree with that. Uh, we we tend to think that because the ultimate judgment has not happened yet, we haven't seen that. That hasn't been something that has been written in the history books yet, of how bad it's going to be. How permanent it's going to be. How many millions upon millions of people are going to be judged and condemned and they will be condemned forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never die in their judgment. There will be no end to their judgment. We don't have that concept of hell and the end time. We look at the Old Testament and go, okay, well, he opened up the ground and 23,000 people fell in it and he closed it up and that was his punishment, but he let the other ones live. And we go, boy, he is a mean God. Really? Boy, you're going to have a real heartache at the end of time when he sits there and does what he does at the end of time. You do realize that's where it's all going, right? And they just, the people they don't get that. They don't understand that's the end. There's two ends, only two ends. One is eternal judgment, forever and ever judged and condemned. The other one is eternal life, and that is by grace through, uh, or by faith through grace alone. 
That's it. There's nothing left. There are only two. There's no in-between. But they don't get that. So they look at the Old Testament, they see the things that happened in the Old Testament, they go, oh, that's pretty bad. Well, I think, you, I think we got some, some good stuff coming. Anyway, chapter 9. Let's go to chapter 9. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. How does all this conversation we've had here today, how does that, now we just discussed recently at Cooper that God never changes. He's the same today as he was back then, thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. and he'll be the same in the future. Mm -hmm. How does all of this add up with that? Well, it, what people tend to do, and in case somebody didn't hear your question, is, is that the, the topic has come up in, in a, other places, that God never changes. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. He hasn't changed. He is the same God, same character, same everything. So, so the question is, is how does all of this... God's judgment in the end and the, the God being mean in the Old Testament, how does it all fit together? And I, I think the way it fits together is, is we see God as being different because we do not understand His story. We do not understand God's purpose and plan. We have, we have disconnected God from any eternal purpose in what He does. What happens in the Old Testament is completely random. What happens with Christ is completely random. What happens in the future is completely random. They're all different stories. They have no connective connectivity to each other. So, and that's what people think. I think it's false. I think it's very, very false. The reason why God is the same in the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament all the way into the future is because He had one plan, one idea, one focus. He has continued that same focus, that same purpose, that same same uh, a thrust and force throughout all of history and it will continue all the way through and see its glory and end at the end of the story. But if you divide the story then God is this schizophrenic, multiple personality kind of person that, you know, one moment he's mean and ugly, the next minute he's uh, a gentle guy with a lamb on his shoulder, and then the next minute he's... Uh, no. No. But I think most of it has to do with the fact that we just don't understand what this says. We don't understand the God of this, this whole thing. There's one God from here to there. And because we don't understand what he is doing, we misinterpret what was done. We look at uh, his picking of Israel. Here's a common one. He picked Israel as a chosen nation. What's so special about them? They're not. God says, you're not special. You're the smallest and the least. I'm going to use you to bless the world. But that's not fair. But, but, but it makes sense now that if that was his purpose was, I want everyone to know. I want to make a name for myself. I want my name to be known. I want to glorify myself. I want people to know me. I need an instrument on earth to do that because otherwise I just have to, you know, every generation or so I'd have to come out in the clouds and dun, 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 dun. this is me. Just want to let you know I'm here. Okay? Y'all got it? Okay, bye. Come out the way for the next bunch of kids to come around. No, he says, okay, here's a group. It's an insignificant, small, rebellious, sinful, common group. And I'm going to make them great to show how great I am. I'm going to show mercy through them. So that the world will know mercy. It's for the world. Remember the covenant with Abraham. Abraham. Abraham, the covenant was, through you, the world will be blessed. That was the plan. Well, when we get out of God's plan, we'll look at something like that and go, well, that's not really fair. Why, did he, why should he favor them? Well, he wasn't. He was favoring them so that I could be blessed. So who's the favorite one? We are all favored. That's, if, that's the point. Yes, exactly. But if you take away God's plan, you don't understand the God's plan in this, I think it becomes very disjointed and the puzzle pieces don't fit together. You need the overall plan and understand what's going on. Okay? okay. Yeah. We're good? <laughs> Ezra, chapter 9. Ezra has come back. Remember in chapter 7 and 8, he's come back. He's taking a bit of a rest. He's had about, the, the, in chapter 
9 verse 1 it says after these things had been done that first line is about four months ish not too long it's been a while he's settled down he's rested they've put all the things that they brought back into the temple they're getting the 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 order of the temple put together and the Levites doing what they're doing etc etc and handing out the letters from the king explaining to all the satraps and governors what their job was all that sort of stuff. So it's about four months is, is what we think it has been. So verse nine or chapter nine, verse one, after these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the people around them. And the leaders and the officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. So this was, we talked a little bit about this last time. Ezra gets news that everyone all the way up through the priests and Levites and all the holy people, they're all mixed up in, in this intermarriage of all these pagan nations that surround them and you know making all this sort of treaties and things of that sort and Ezra knows it's wrong is it a racial thing no. it's not if it's not a racial thing if it's not a nationality type of thing we got to keep the Jews pure the Jewish gene pure what is he talking about? What was the problem with mixing or intermarrying with the pagans? You know, the pagans worshipped other gods and, and they would have influence on uh, the Jews in that regard and lead them away. Exactly. The, the pagans had other cultural beliefs, other cultural values, other religious beliefs, other religious values, other gods, and God had commanded to not mix with that. Go back to, keep your hand right here, okay? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And let's see what God really wanted. I think it's important to know what God wanted. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. So I'm page 285 in your black Bibles. So Deuteronomy chapter 7. And if I, can I have somebody read verses... 1 through 6. Would someone like to? I'll try it. All right. I can't pronounce his name. If you, if you don't, just skip it. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Gergesites, Ammonites, Canaanites, Perizzites, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, all the other right. Seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols and in the fire. Ver go to verse 6. Put it through verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Okay. That's a wonderful passage of scripture, by the way. So, what was the reason why? Why did he say, do not marry or intermarry? Phyllis, why did he say, do not intermarry? Hint, verse 4. <laughs> because they would start worshiping idols and yes it's exactly exactly that is exactly correct it's in verse 4 for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods 
and your Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. There will be consequences for this. That was, that was Moses' like, final words to Israel. Deuteronomy is, it literally means second law. It's a second reading. They're just about to go into the land. Moses is going to, at the end of Deuteronomy, he's going to be up on a mountain and die. God's going to take him away. Joshua's going to go in. And his, this is his final command. My final words to you is, stay away from marrying those people. They will lead you away. It's not that your blood will be intermixed and you'll have, you know, you can't have uh, 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 black people marrying white people because then you get this brown. And no, all that sort of stuff that I heard growing up, that's, that's not the reason. That's not what God wants. That's not the reason why. It's because they will change your worship. You will worship some other God. You will do things a different way. So that was, that's Deuteronomy. That's what these people of Israel, back to chapter 9 of Ezra, that's what these people of Israel come to Ezra and say, even our priests are doing this. So, what does Ezra do? Ezra's response is in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 9. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled my hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of, of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Why do you think his response was so dramatic? Because he understood the consequences. He understood what God told him, and they was going against it. So what's that? Was okay. So why they were where they were? He realized why they were where they were. In other words, he realized why they, how every, okay. He realized now why they were why they were slaves and why they had been taken and why why uh, everything that had happened to the Israelites was allowed to happen was because they. Okay, so we have from you, we have the answer that Ezra realized what, why all, God had done all that he had done to the Israelites up to this point. Because of sin, that's where, why they were where they were. They were in exile, they were under the captivity of another nation, they were still under Persian captivity. All of this, he realized, is because of their sin. You commented that he realized the potential consequence of this sin. So it's past realization and future fear. Do you understand that? Sin, may, we may end up in a part of our life, in a place in our life, and realize that sin brought us to where we are or may have had something to do with how we got where we are. And then we're in that spot and we find that we're still maybe doing the things that we shouldn't be doing. At this point and juncture in our lives, we should look back and acknowledge the sin that got us where we are and then be fearful that we haven't changed, we haven't learned, we're still doing the same thing and that future consequence is sure to come. Something is going to come. So we have, Ezra is at a point, he's at a, at a pinnacle point, a, a, a moment in time when he can look back and see, ah, this is why God did what he did. This is why our consequences are the way they are. And at the same moment, going, oh, but these people haven't learned. Again, they haven't learned. Look what they're doing. And he is, he is stuck in this, in the weight of, what more does God have to do? And we're, you'll see as he go, we go in the next section, he's at, the, at 3 o'clock, that's the time of the evening sacrifice, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, he is going to get up and he's going to pray. He's going to intercede as the priest of Israel. He's going to intercede for these people and listen to his prayer. And tell me if you can't feel the absolute hopelessness in his voice in his prayer. Let's move to the next section. Verse 5, and we'll read through his prayer. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak 
torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God. Because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in His sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, O oh our God, what can we say after this? For we have dis disregarded the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons and, or take their daughters for your sons. Do not treat, seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence." So what do you think of that prayer? Uh, it's, it's exactly what you said. Well, part of it is exactly what you said. Yes, very good, Tracy. I was going to say it reminds me of me. It reminds you of you? Yeah. How's that? I know my nature is to do my own thing the way I want. And I... Fear God enough to pray, oh Lord, stop me. I'm trusting you will love me and stop me from offending you and turning my back on you. I, because I know that's sort of, well, it's my history, so mm -hmm. it reminds me of me. I don't oh, know good. if anyone else good. saw it there. Remind everybody of themselves. That's how well, we are. if you look in the first part of this, he approaches his prayer very differently than what I do or what I have done. There are very few times I can say I prayed like this. I can think of maybe two in my whole life. And it's primarily because of that first part. I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face. I don't think, with the exception of those one or two times, I've ever really been ashamed to lift up my face. It's been so easy to ask for forgiveness. Probably too easy. The weight of what I have done, the weight of my guilt, I don't think I often feel. That scares me sometimes because I think it should. I think that sin should, if I have Christ living within me and I have just spit on Christ's work, like you were talking about earlier, in my sin, my, my, my willful rebellion against God, 
it is as if I just went on Christ and all of his work. I have just disregarded, he uses the word disregarded. Look at all the grace that he gives. He has given grace. You have graciously given this. You have done this again and again. Your loving kindness, your patience, your mercy, your providence, your protection. You're putting a wall around all that. And yet, what shall we do? Should we get to the end of this thing? Shall we, shall we keep on doing what got us here in the first place? Yet, what about you? But I often find myself facing about the same type of sin and going, why? Why the pause? Why the pause? Why even think about it? I've already, I've already learned the lesson. I've already been disciplined. He says he's going to discipline his sons and daughters, right? Why would I even hesitate? Why is there that moment of, hmm. oh, God help us if we stand on that hesitation too long? Because you know what happens when, when I stand on that hesitation? Nine times out of ten, probably even more than that, if I stand on that hesitation too long, I'll do it. It should be immediate. No. Get behind me. No. That's not right. I know what that consequence is. I know what God has done for me. I do not want to spit on God, Christ's work, on His love for me. When you get to this prayer... You have so much. In, in verse 7, you have acknowledgement of God's faithfulness to His covenant. He must punish covenant breakers. He said uh, in Deuteronomy 31, if you do this, if you don't keep my covenant, I will bring punishment. He says that. So he's faithful to his covenant. He, sa he said, this is what I'll do if you break my covenant. So he did what he said he was going to do. That's faithfulness. Dis do you know faithfulness? That discipline is faithfulness? Have you ever th thought of that? God's punishment, the spanking that he gives you, is faithfulness. As a Christian, don't we trust him to spank us than to let us just wander off? And I don't off? think so. I think it's a rare thing for Christians to look at, at God's punishment discipline as a faithful thing, as a, something we trust in. It's something we dodge, I think, more. We think we can get away with it. We think we can get around it. We think we can play in the gray area just long enough. And then we'll, you know, we'll pull ourselves out. You know, when it, when, you know, I remember when you go, went to the ocean. Have you ever been to the ocean? And you, and you go out in the ocean, you fill the pool, you get in the, the little the pool, like this up about to here, and you get that pool, pull, 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 the pull from the ocean when the water goes back out into the sea. And you, you kind of feel that, sand. yeah, the sand's coming out from under your toes and stuff. You're like, and it's like, oh, that's kind of cool, that's kind of cool. So you go a little deeper. And, it, and, and you, get that, you get that pull again. Well, you do it when you're up here. And you realize you can't pull yourself back and hold yourself in place. That, that wave is strong enough now to lift you up off <laughs> that you're going down. I see sin very much the same way. I think that's what happens. We, we play in the water in the shallow end of sin. And we fill the pool. Man, I'm just messing up that word. The pool, pull, pull, thank you, pull of, the, of that it's coming, it's coming, but no, 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 I, 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 can, I, I can hold off, I can hold off. Well, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sooner or later, you're going under. In verses 8 and 9, we see the acknowledgement, Ezra acknowledges and recognizes God's gracious care, despite the sin, despite the consistent generational rebellion. In eight or in ten or ten through twelve, he confesses the sin, and then in thirteen, he acknowledges that there's consequence to the sin. This is what you were saying, Tracy. Going back, the reason why we are where we are is because of the sins of our fathers and our forefathers. We were doing this before; we just never learned. 
We didn't think it was all that important. He acknowledged, acknowledges that they are worthy of punishment in, verse, in the second part of verse 13. He says, uh, You have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. You haven't punished sin the way you should have punished sin, not in accordance with your holiness, your righteousness. You've given grace and mercy. And then there's warnings against further sin if, in verse 14. Shall we again break our commands? Or break your commands? And this goes back to what we were talking about, I think, with, with Ed a little bit. There's a fear of God's further punishment, and there's a fear of spitting on God's grace. Both should cause us to fear. We have, we have that, that moment where we're getting pulled, and we should, we should immediately realize that God's faithful. God is faithful and just. He will bring consequence and discipline to those whom He loves. There will be an end. Do you know what? There's consequence to those who He doesn't, are not found in His love at the end of time too. It's not just God's consequences are to those He loves. God is going to have to judge all sin sometime. Either it will, be, it will have been judged at the cross in Christ, or it will be judged at the end of time outside of the cross. But either way, God will judge all of sin for all people. Right? This, the end of time, before the throne of God, too late. No hope. Nothing left. It's the cross now or nothing later. We will be, as Paul said, we will be completely and totally guilty as charged, silenced, and standing before a righteous, holy, majestic, glorious king. And he will judge. And there won't be, well, you were good enough. You did some nice things. Well, what is? <laughs> yeah. And this is where it get, verse 15 hits. He finishes his prayer without hope. Look at how he says this. Verse 15. O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. You are just. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. That's what Paul said in verse 19 of chapter 3. We stand before a righteous, holy God, condemned under law, condemned under the things that God has revealed about himself in nature and all of of the universe and all of creation and we have rejected it therefore no man is without excuse all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God where's the hope where's Ezra's hope what are you gonna do sacrifice an animal that's gonna take care of the problem it didn't take care of the problem for the 2,000 years before that They've had sacrifices all the way back to the time of Adam and Eve. It didn't, it couldn't do it. it. It couldn't get at the heart of the problem. There is deep need for something better, something more effective, something that will get at really the heart of the problem of this people. Chapter 10 is Ezra's answer. He has no hope. He has no really good answer. So in chapter 10, we get a man answer, a man-made answer. While Ezra was praying, this is chapter 10, verse 1. While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping and throwing himself down before the house of God, 
a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him. They too wept bitterly. Just a note, it does not say men only. It does not say men and women only. It said men, women, and children were lying down weeping and mourning before God. The whole family knew the consequences and the heaviness and the guilt and the consequences what might come. They felt the weight. Children, don't you dare tell me I can't teach my kid the Bible. Don't you dare tell me that teaching my children at age six the Word of God is futile. That's my job. That is a parent's job. You are to raise your children in the instruction and the admonition of the Lord. Parents, do it. And if it don't get, it doesn't sink in, that's in God's hands, not yours. You be faithful. But these people, these children, and these women, and these men, these families, knew the consequence. Verse 2. Then Sekinai, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. Let it be done according to the law. Rise up, this matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. What was this man's answer? Send them away. Yeah, let's break up whole families and their kids and we'll send them away. There's a lot of people, I don't say there's a lot of people. This is a very difficult passage in 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 scholarly, the Bible teachers of, of all going way back, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, have debated on this. Is this the proper answer to this sin? And I'm not going to take one side or the other. I'm not going to say that this, because that's exactly what Ezra does. Ezra is going to say, so be it. Let's gather all the people together uh, and you know, here's the solution. We're going to take all of you people that have married and have kids and you've, had mar you've married foreign wives, all your sons and daughters who've been, you're going to separate them. You're going to send those people away. Much like Abraham sent away Hagar. Remember when he, was, he sent away Hagar? Right? right? Yeah. Same, same type of mentality. We're just going to send them away. So now the children have no father. We don't know if they were supported or not. We don't know where they went or with whom, who took care of them, but this entire region of people, this nation, this, this, all these exiles, now have to get rid of all these wives, all of these children, and send them away. Just cut them off. I, I, I don't know that that's good, but I don't know that keeping them there would be good either. I am thinking, and maybe this is, this is just me you know, putting this on the, the text, I think the point is, is that sin is, the, the solutions of sin, deep sin, is never easy. It, it always has consequences. If you, keep, if you keep it up, you're in violation of God. You're going to, it's going to drive you further away, going to separate you more, going to put you more under the consequence than under the blessing of God. But at times, taking the scalpel to the cancer and cutting out the cancer, that can have deep consequences also. So I'm not really sure whether this is, this is a great moment in Israel's history or whether it just is an, a very unfortunate and sad consequence of disobedience to God's word. So in verses 7 through 
9, we have this gathering. We're going to set up a meeting. We're going to gather together. And I'm going to skip that part. We're going to go to verse 10. Because Ezra, after he brings the elders together, he decides this is what needs to be done. In verse 10, he says, or the, the Bible says, Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do His will. Separate yourselves from the people around you and from your foreign wives. So what's the remedy? It's in different parts. What's the first part? First part, confess. confess. confess yeah. Verse 11 is confess. What's the next one? Do His will. Do His will. This is very interesting. It is, it is interesting to me that when I hear people talk about confession, I very rarely hear that second part. It may be there. It may be their intent. But it's, I don't, it's, it's, it's often un, unspoken, I think. We feel that confession is just merely taking a bath. And then I can go back outside and play in the dirt. And that's not what God's saying. Confession is repentance, turning away from the dirt, turning away from what is wrong, turning away from what is not in God's will. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And then we had to take a bath. Yes. And then we went back outside. Yes, I do. That was that was that was a little foolish for me to let you do that, huh? Why go out and play with frogs and get all dirty and then go take a bath and then let you go back outside and play with the frogs in the dirt again, huh? Not very smart. Papa realized that after he let you go outside. <laughs> It was true. We did it. In fact, it was just it was yesterday, I think. This, this is just a side note. <laughs> in, in Sunday school this morning, somebody said, don't wrestle with a pig because both of you are going to get dirty, but the pig enjoys it. Ooh. Yeah? Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, like That's true. Enjoys the dirt. Enjoys the dirt, yes. Mud. Or the mud, yes. So the first one is Make confession. Second one is do His will. What's the third one? Separate. Separate yourselves. Now mind you, it's in two parts. The first part says separate yourselves from the people around you. And then the second part says and from your foreign wives. That's, that's, that's not a mistake. Those are two separate things. Separate yourself. Let me see if I can quote the, quote the verse. Do not be conformed to the, th to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2, I think, if I remember right. That's basically what Ezra is saying. Don't be conformed to them. Don't intermingle in their ways, in their practices, in their cultural beliefs, in the things that they do. Don't do that. And then, get rid of the wives. Verse 12 says that the whole assembly responded with a loud voice, You are right, we must do as you say. There's a little bit of contention in verses 13 through 14. Verses 15, there are actually family members, families that refuse. So even though this great reform is coming, even though it was very heavy, there are still people that said, uh-uh, we, we're not going to do that. They disagreed, and they continued the way they were. Verse 16, so the exiles did as was proposed. Ezra the priest selected men from where, men who were family heads, one from each family division, and all of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, 
They sat down to investigate the cases, and by the first day of the first month, they finished dealing with all the men who had married foreign wives, or foreign women. Verse 44, all these had married foreign women, and some of them had children by these wives. Everything in verses 18 through 43 is talking mostly about priests. These are all priestly people. These are all the Levites, the temple servants, etc., etc. That's just the temple people. That's just the priestly people. That's not the regular folk. And some of these had children. And that's the end of Ezra. So the children went with the mothers? Children went with the mothers. Because they were impure. Um, it says that they opposed it. Does it say that they refused it? Or is that just... Uh you can oppose something and still go along with everybody else. You're right, and thank you for that, that correction. I shouldn't say that they said no. They opposed it. They may have ultimately been pressured in it, but it wasn't done willingly. That, that much I think we can deduce from this. They opposed it. And that's the, she's talking about in verse 15, the Jonathan and Jehaziel, Jehaziah, and Meshulam, and Sabathani, they were Levites, the Levite, they opposed this. But that ends Ezra. Now Ezra's story is not finished. Ezra carries over into Nehemiah. Nehemiah really is the continuation of the story of Ezra. Nehemiah is coming to help support him. But it ends on a very sad note. It ends without much hope without much resolution there isn't there isn't rescue do you understand why I say it? it seems like God has brought the story of the Old Testament to its ultimate conclusion that man cannot do for himself He's left with nothing. There's nothing left. The sacrifices aren't doing it. The temple worship isn't doing it. The covenants are not doing it. There's, there's, there, mankind is just, <coughs> just habitually down. But what did Paul say about delivering me from the body of this death? Paul evens all the apostles. <coughs> who knew Jesus personally and preached and sacrificed and died uh, in his name, still couldn't stand himself or trust this body that we're in to do what's right. This person in this body. Yes. Oh, wretched man, Thank who you. shall deliver me from this body of death? Yes. And now that you mentioned that, because that's in Romans, that's where we're going back to. And we'll close in Romans. Because they're unlike the Old Testament, unlike the story of Ezra, Ezra points to a day when God said, my timing is now. Now my king, my anointed one, my son, my beloved son, is now here. And step back, because he's got some things he's got to do. And so in Romans, chapter 3 again, after we finish all of that, we got to the same, same type of feeling that Ezra left us in chapter 9, and in chapter 9 of his prayer, we have that 19 and 20, you know, we're all standing before a righteous God and there is no hope, there is nothing left. We come to verse 20. 21, excuse me. Uh, chap Romans chapter 3, verse 21. We have Paul arguing, giving the charge, we are all guilty. There's nothing we can do. There's no, no, no righteousness within us. There's no good within us. We do not do good. We do not seek God. We are completely and totally without hope. 
just like Ezra finishes his deal. And then he says in verse 21, unlike Ezra, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice. Because of His forbearance, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ or in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that the observing of the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. There's your rescue. There's the solution. There's the hallelujah. There's the, the hope. When the Bible says that Christ is our hope, there's good reason for that. He is our hope. He is our life. He is the way. He is the perfect sacrifice. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a, what a marvelous entrance, entrance to this moment in time. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect man, the perfect God Himself comes in body, in the flesh, lives a holy life, does, sets up His life and sacrifices His life for people who cannot sacrifice their life. They can't do it. They're in, stuck in Ezra. They're stuck at verse 20 of Paul going, I'm standing before a righteous God and there is no hope. I cannot say anything. I am just a dumb, silenced sheep. And Jesus says, hold on. I have that one. That one's mine. My father's given that one to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, yes. That's the but now, but God. I love the but gods when I read Paul. Paul does a lot of those but God stuff. He gives you this, this horrible, horrible depravity of humanity. You have no hope, no answer, no chance, no resource, nothing that you can grab to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and get into heaven. To make yourself right before a holy, righteous, majestic, glorified God. Not glorified, glory. Yeah, glorified God. He is glorified, I hope. All of creation will glorify Him. Anyway, you can't do that. There is no answer, no solution. And then Jesus says, I am the solution. I am the way. The one, only, exclusive. There is no other. Why? Because all of humanity, Ezra says, since our forefathers, our forefathers sin, our forefather's guilt is on us today. We're still paying the consequences of sin. Do you know what? We're paying the consequences not only for our own sin and the things that we've voluntarily done wrong in our own life, our own rebellion, but we're paying for that original sin, chapter 5 of Romans, all the way back to Adam. Our forefather did it. Our forefather committed sin and rebellion 
and we pay the price. There's nothing that we can do. And unlike Ezra, it says, this righteousness, what righteousness? The righteousness in Christ. It's His righteousness. It's not my righteousness. It's Jesus. Jesus was the righteous one. Not I. The, this righteousness from God. Where did Jesus come from? From God. Comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To anybody who can muster up enough good goodwill and, and kindness and love? No. To all who believe. That's it. That's how we're justified. That's how we how God can say, I can't close my eyes to sin. You have sin. You're guilty. You're standing before my holiness and I can't just ignore your sin. It has to be addressed. But you can't do it. So I'm going to send somebody who can. And I will pour my wrath for that sin, that guilt. I'll pour it on him. And he'll take it. Now, if we get to a place in our life where we think sin is mm, kind of just, you know, whatever. It's not really that big a deal. That's life. That's life. Yeah. You know, I just, this is what happens. <laughs> Everybody messes up sometimes, you know. you know. There's just that, you know. If it's so casual, if the way we live is so casual, so easy. How come it took something so horrible as God giving His only Son, His perfect, righteous, holy Son to be made in our fleshly image, so to speak, lived with us, be spit on, humiliated, whipped, tortured, belittled, disrespected, blasphemed against, and ultimately killed. If it was really not that big a deal. Why couldn't he just come and... Okay, we're good. Enough punishment. No. No, I think we don't consider the work of Christ and what God did through Christ enough it's not it doesn't have as much impact on us because we think so casually of the holiness of God there was a time when I thought you know what I'll pray I'll pray God show me how how ugly my sin is and then I'll love you more I'll appreciate your grace more. And perhaps that might be okay. It might be somewhat like David's, Lord, search my heart. If you see anything within me that is wrong, then reveal it and take care of it. Get rid of it. Similar to that. But I'll give you a better one. Father, show me your holiness. Show me your glory. Show me your majesty. Show me your perfection. Let me, let me try to stand in that for a while. Let me just bask in your holiness and understand it for what it really is, as best as I can possibly understand it. You grasp God's holiness. You can't. You will not handle the sin. You'll get to that edge of that water, that tidal wave, and you'll fill that pool and you go, oh no. Oh, no, 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 no. Lord, please, do not lead me into temptation. Keep me away from all that stuff. Because it will. It will be much more significant. Sin. We will see sin against a holy God. 
That's what Ezra saw. And he ripped his hair out and laid himself on the ground and wept and wept and wept and wept and wept. And when it came time to pray, his prayer was, we are so overwhelmed, the guilt is over our heads. We are literally drowning in our guilt. And we are, we're standing before you. We can't even stand before you. Thankfully, thankfully, there's a but now. Hmm. Let's pray.